He rushed back to his shed to tell everyone else that the couple wanted to book again, and everyone shared a hearty laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everybody, welcome back to another brand new episode of Brain Blaze. I, as always, I'm your host, Simon Wamsey, one of my writers, in this case, Kevin writes me a script. I'm going to read it. Sam is going to edit it. If you enjoy this channel, if you enjoy learning facts in a more laid back format, it's a bit easy going, but also somehow not easy going. Uh, hit that subscribe button. Make sure you like this video, even though you don't even know if you like it yet. And let's jump in. One of my favorite shows in college was Mission Hill. Never heard of it, Kevin, to nobody's surprise. It was an animated sitcom that sadly only had one season thanks to it airing on the WB, the absolute wrong channel for the show. It was created by Bill Oakley and Josh Weinstein. Wait, Josh Weinstein? Is he a real person? <laughs> isn't he a character from Entourage? Uh, is that he's Josh Weinstein, isn't it? Shit, I guess it's not a, like, a super uncommon name. Is it? Two of the early writers of The Symptoms, I may be biased as one of the main characters, was a ridiculous nerd named Kevin, who happened to get the same SAT score that I did, though unlike with the cartoon character, I did not get my score printed on a t-shirt. Kevin, little bit of a humble brag there, it's a, I bet it's a good SAT score, isn't it? In one memorable episode, Kevin's older brother, Andy, got discouraged after constantly being unable to get into all the coolest Mission Hill nightclubs. Since they couldn't get into a real club anyway, and his friend had an idea, they went to the alley on the side of their apartment building and placed a boom box inside the building's boiler room, loudly pumping club music. Then they placed a stanchion. That's, that's one of those big GPA words that I don't know. What the f*** is a stanchion? With velvet rope outside the door and stood there like bouncers. Within seconds of placing the velvet rope by the door, a line began forming with a person trying to tell them he was friends with the owner in an attempt to get in. The boiler room was suddenly the hottest new nightclub with a, bla with a line a block long. The only people that ever got in were friends of theirs who were in on the gag. In one instance, their neighbor came up to the door with her baby. After sizing them up like a real club's bouncers had done to them, and he declared that only the baby could go in and he grabbed her from the woman, handing it off to his father inside the boiler room. Eventually, Andy and his friends got bored with the whole thing, so they set off a smoke bomb to pretend that the boiler room had burned down, but people continued to talk about how it was the greatest club that they'd ever seen. The whole thing was really entertaining, but this was just a cartoon in 1999. There's no way that something like that could possibly work in the real world, especially not in 2017 when the internet has the ability to fact check things. Right. I get the feeling, Kevin, that that's exactly the story you're going to be presenting us with today because I also read the title of today's episode. Yes, that's the sort of big brain that I am, Kevster. The idea. It all began in April 2017. Uber Butler had been a writer for Vice magazine for about a year and a half at that point, but it wasn't his first writing gig. His first job as a writer was to create fake reviews for restaurants on TripAdvisor. Oh no! He was a particularly gifted bullshit artist, and the small reviews he was paid $10 each for helped improve the fortunes of many restaurants. By cheating customers. Also, £10? Sorry, £10 for a review? It's pretty good. Like, how long does it take to type a review? Five minutes? That's some pretty good paid work. I'll write some fake reviews for 10 quid. This led to Uber holding a belief that despite being well respected and billing itself as the world's largest guidance platform, that everything on TripAdvisor was a lie. He believed that none of the meals people reviewed ever took place. The people and their experiences they shared, none of it was real. The only thing he thought you couldn't fake was the restaurant itself. But then something changed. A dramatic shift happened in society, and people seemed not only willing but eager to accept internet misinformation as reality, no matter how utterly bullshit it was when 2017 rolled around uber thought that given the current climate of misinformation that maybe just maybe he could actually get a fake restaurant on tripadvisor there was one big hurdle he had to first clear though you see tripadvisor doesn't just let anyone anonymously submit a restaurant to their site he needed a phone number so uber went and bought a burner phone for 15 dollars that's the barrier of entry you need a phone number you can go onto skype and buy one for three pounds a month or whatever oh, maybe it's not that cheap it's super cheap and they'll give you a number and it doesn't even have to be a mobile number you can get like a landline number which i guess looks more legit Hi, the Power Pop Girls. Hi. that gave him everything he needed to submit a fake restaurant you need just a phone number trip advisor how about make you know just doing better i mean they probably do better nowadays and 
sometimes they just need to be shown normally a restaurant would be expected to have an address which would be a problem there was no actual restaurant and anyone could just put the address into google street view and see that there wasn't one but for some reason all tripadvisor required was that you list a street not the actual number uber chose to name his restaurant the shed at dulwich because that's where he lived it does sound like that's a real restaurant i don't know if it's just like that does sound like a london restaurant the shed uh, there's, there's a restaurant near where my parents live that's got a very similar name to that. It's very good. It's got nice, nice food. He rented someone else's shed in Dulwich, an area in South London, for which he paid £800 a month. He's paying £800 a month to rent a shed? That's fucking crazy, London. <laughs> Given today's rent prices, that honestly seems like a steal for rent. Oh no, Kevin, you've misunderstood. He's renting a shed, like a literal shed, for £800 a month. He's not getting somewhere to live. You could get a room in London for £800 a month, could you? Maybe you could. Maybe you could get a room. A small room in a bad part of town. I have no idea. Like, my last experience with London rent was 10 years ago. And I honestly I can't even remember how much I paid. I don't think it was £800 a month, though. No chance. It was less. But it was pretty rubbish. Given today's rent prices, that honestly seem like a steal, even to live in someone's literal shed. I don't think he's living there. I think he's just got as a place to keep his bikes and shit. The next step was to take pictures for the website that he would create for the restaurant. He took pictures of what looked like delicious food, but was absolutely not edible. One delectable looking dessert was a sponge soaked in brown paint alongside dollops of shaving cream and topped with coffee beans. I'm assuming he used items he had around the house, since shaving cream is actually far more expensive than whipped cream would have been. Another picture showed a does it power bleach toilet block, completely coated with honey and garnished with something green and leafy that happened to be growing in the yards. But of course, Oh, that sounds rough. But of course, the piece de resistance was a fried egg resting on Uber's foot and liberally doused with pepper. There was also some green leafy garnish as well. Once all was said and done, it was time to submit everything to TripAdvisor. On May the 5th, 2017, the shed at Dulwich was approved and posted on TripAdvisor's website. It was brand new, so it was ranked 18,149 out of 18,419 restaurants. Wait, it was ranked lower than the number of restaurants there are? Maybe just because there are lots of new restaurants opening? or Maybe because it's a typo, who knows? Getting the restaurant onto the respected travel site wasn't the goal, though. The goal was get it to number one. This is n is this gonna happen? This is gonna happen. This is gonna be like one of those. It's one of these things that British people love, like Boaty McBoatface. We're just gonna go nuts for this, and it's gonna happen. But TripAdvisor just take it down, surely. And Uber had a plan to accomplish this easily. Rise to the top. Once the restaurant was live on TripAdvisor, all that was left to do was to create the fake reviews. They do have methods in place to try and weed out fake reviews, so Uber couldn't write them all himself. He enlisted his friends to help write reviews, but consistency was key. If one review says it's the best outdoor vegan restaurant that they'd ever been to, and the next talked about sitting in a booth inside to order all-you-can-eat ribs, well, that's obviously going to be a problem. There were four key points that the reviews were never supposed to deviate from. First, the restaurant was outside. Second, it was weird as f Third, it was small, and finally, and most importantly, it was by appointment only. This last point, combined with the reviews, leaning into the quirky menu is what really caught people's attention. Trendy people and tourists like stupid, gimmicky menus, and Ubar played into that. I hate this. Like, I, I don't want, like, anything too weird. Like, and I'll like tasting some weird food, but don't go too weird. And one thing that drives me insane is places that think they're so hip and that they cut they think comfort isn't a factor while i'm eating like if i'm sitting down i want to be sitting on a cushion i don't want to be sitting on a bench and more importantly than that i want to be able to lean back like this i don't want to sit on a on a stool and i don't want to sit on a bench it's just not okay and often these are it's not because the place is cheap it's because the place is expensive and they're like oh because we focus on the food all right so spend three pounds on a cushion you fucks drives me mad and it's like maybe i'll like their food but i can't stand sitting on like something uncomfortable and being like oh this food's amazing and it's like oh yeah but i'd really like to lean back right now oh god why it's just ridiculous and also places that don't serve like diet coke and they're like oh we have like a uh, fentiman's cola i'm like do you have it without fucking sugar because i don't want it with sugar and they're like no we don't have that do you have no we have you can have water and that's like, for fuck's sake i just want a diet drink and look I get that there's all these like novelty colas and stuff, but do you know who's cracked cola? Fucking Coca Cola! Jesus.
On the shed's website, they explain that they don't serve menu items, they serve moods. I would never go to this place. I'd be like, People would be like, the food's amazing. I'd just be like, I'm not going to like it. I promise you I'm not going to like it. It was all intended to be some sort of snarky joke, like the description of love was a plate with so much fatty food that it would cause the diner to have a heart attack. Between the silly menu and the exclusivity, people started to take notice. It didn't take long for The Shed to break the top 10,000 restaurants in London. Considering half of those restaurant listings are probably Starbucks and Taco Bells, getting into the top 50% isn't that impressive. Do they have Taco Bell in London? I don't think so. But that's when something extraordinary happened. The burner phone rang. Somebody wanted to make an appointment. Yeah, of course people are going to want to. Just turn them all down. It's time we're fully booked. Went till 2024. <laughs> it was this 2017. That's like seven years of the future. <laughs> Ebar wasn't really prepared for the call, but he told them they were booked out for the next six months. Another phone call came in, along with dozens of emails. Seemingly overnight, the shed had jumped all the way up to the top 1,500 restaurants in London. Then, things started spiraling out of control. This is beautiful. A PR firm contacted Ebar to try and help publicize the site. The phone was getting upwards of 200 calls each day. <laughs> Television executive. Television. <laughs> I love this. Fucking brilliant. Television executives were messaging The Shed from their work emails as an attempt to show off their clout and trying to secure a table. <laughs> that is so clowny. I never email people from my work email because I'm too embarrassed. I always just email it from like my, it's like a super generic Gmail email. <laughs> And I always worry that people who, like, because people in restaurants think like this, don't they? Like, oh, this prick's email for me, like, his work email or whatever. You know who I am? I've seen you before. You're the asshole on TV. Just let me interrupt today's video to tell you about today's sponsor, War Thunder, which is what? The most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made. There has never been a game so comprehensive. With more than 2,000 tanks, planes, helicopters, and ships in dynamic combined arms PvP battles, every vehicle, incredibly detailed, modeled down to their individual components, offering a highly immersive combat experience. And you might be thinking, where can I play this, Simon? <laughs> How can I play the most diverse, immersive vehicle combat game? I don't have a computer that was crafted by the hands of God himself with a GT Turbo 7700 or whatever graphics card in it. Well, good news. You can play it on PC. You can play it on Xbox Series X and S. You can play it on PlayStation 5. You can even play it on the previous console generations. That's right. Look, if you're looking for a fast action-packed match or more realistic and tactical experience, yeah, I've only ever played the, like, fast stuff because I'm always like, I don't know, video games for me are little breaks in the day. Like, I'll record some videos, play a little game, record some videos, play a little game, send some emails, play a little, it's like little rewards for myself where I, so I just jump in, play a little quick thing rather than, you know, getting deep into it because then my, my life will just be sucked away. <laughs> So, yeah, I, I like video games. I like video games too much. War Thunder offers intense PvP battles at various immersion levels for all play styles, whichever you prefer you will find. Also, there's an in-depth customization system for vehicles. Apply hundreds of camouflages, historical markings anywhere on your machines, as well as 3D decorators such as bushes and equipment. I haven't done that, but I will give that a go. So, play War Thunder for free on PC, PS5, and Xbox Series X or S at playwt.link forward slash brainblazewt bonus. And because that link is a nightmare. Guys, what is up with that link? <laughs> there is it in the description below. Click on it, check it out. You'll be able to get an exclusive bonus as well, which is fantastic. And uh, yeah, back to today's video. By August, it hit 156 on TripAdvisor. Even though there was no address listed, companies were using Google Maps to pinpoint where they thought the restaurant might be and were mailing boxes of free samples to the shed where Ubar lived. While walking down the street, he encountered a couple that were searching for the restaurants. After they asked him and he said he didn't know where it was, he had to quickly flee the conversation as one of them pulled out a phone to call the burner that was in his pocket. You could just pretend, like, you, if that happened to me, I'd be like, oh, what a weird coincidence. Pull out the phone, say excuse me, and then wander off and take the bloody phone call. Or not, just hang up. <laughs> the mood themes menu may have got to people's attention initially, but the exclusivity was making the story spread like wildfire. No one could get a table, and there wasn't even an address listed. Not only were people desperately trying to book a table to tromp down on some toilet bowl cleaner, but the town of Bromley emailed Uber asking him to consider moving the restaurant to a new area that they were developing. An Australian production company even wanted to feature the shed in their in-flight video. <laughs> This is 
extraordinary. He didn't even try that hard. People even started sending resumes hoping to apply for jobs at the shed, which seemed to be the only part that Ubar felt at all guilty about. I, I well, don't feel guilty about this. It's a great joke. Anyone who doesn't enjoy this is just doesn't have a sense of humor. You have a poison in your mind, and the fact that you can't see it makes me so sad. Which makes sense, because f with TV execs and douchey, douchey socialites is hilarious, but f with desperate people looking for jobs is much less funny. Yeah, sorry, I meant uh, the first thing, not about the people, because they just want jobs. <laughs> but also, the people applying, they probably applied for like 700 jobs. Assuming they're like not some sort of mega chef or whatever looking for a job, they're just like looking to wash dishes or whatever, they're gonna put their resume in like dozens of places, they don't think about it a second time. I'll just choose to believe that the people who felt qualified enough to work at one of the top restaurants in London already had other jobs or job offers so this can remain a victimless crime, I think it is. The shed's rise at the top had been meteoric, but then two things happened. On November the 1st, 2017, almost seven months after the farce had began, the shed was TripAdvisor's number one restaurant in London with 89,000 searches per day. It was a fake restaurant with pictures of food which ranged from a foot to straight up poison, and it was the top restaurant in all of London. Having perpetrated one of the most incredible and ridiculous hoaxes of the 21st century, there was only one thing that Ubar could do. Start taking reservations. Legends. <laughs> Where are we going with this? I can't believe that I don't. I'm sure lots of British people are super familiar with this story, but somehow this one just passed me by. Opening night, Ubal decided that he was going to call back some of the people that had attempted to make reservations and serve 20 guests in one night. The plan was to turn the single room shed in which he lived and the garden leaning. Wait, so he really lives in the shed? Wait. <laughs> He really lives in a shed? What's up? The plan was to turn the single room shed in which he lived and the garden that surrounded the shed into the restaurant that everyone described in the reviews. Since the restaurant's initial success was entirely based on fake reviews, its successful opening night was going to have to come down to fake customers. There would be 20 real customers as well, but the real customers were scheduled to come in smaller groups and were surrounded by Uber's friends who would be loudly talking about how delicious everything was. Oh, this is so good. This is so clever. God, I love this. But was the food going to be delicious? Well, at least it was going to be food and not bleach, so that's a step in the right direction. He's gonna serve, like, it's gonna be like Tesco microwave meals or something, isn't it? The goal was to replicate the restaurant as described in the reviews, and the food was described as reminding people of home. To that end, Ubar decided that he was going to serve them the food that he grew up eating, frozen dinners. <laughs> The first course would be minestrone cup noodle served in a mug followed by either veggie lasagna or truffle mac and cheese, and for dessert, pudding again served out of a mug. I'm getting the distinct impression that Ubar's shed just happened to have lots of mugs and not a lot of plates. Despite being billed as the hottest and most exclusive restaurant in London, the average cost per plate was a pound. I worry that now you're serving people food and stuff that you're gonna, like, what if one of them gets sick from your dodgy food that you made in your shed where you live? I worry that that could get you into some legal hot water. Of course, there's a whole lot of legal stuff involved in having a restaurant. Yes, there are. I don't know how laws compare in the UK to the US, but it'd probably need to get a license to serve food, have an inspection by the health department, and a bunch of other stuff. I think I watched a YouTube video where some guy set up a, a dark kitchen. He was a YouTuber and he was like, I'm going to make money serving food on like uber eats and he was just microwaving food in his house and handing it to uh uber drivers and the way he got around it was the some like grace period so he said like yeah no my restaurant's up and running and then he had like two weeks before health inspectors came like there's like a grace period and he just did it in there and then he closed down in the u.s you probably need to get a license to serve food have an inspection by the health department and a bunch of other stuff yeah i feel like he would have to have this or he could just tell all the guests they were filming some press things so the meals for the evening would all be free after all serving people food at your house isn't a crime even if they happen to believe it's a fancy restaurant that that is some big brain shit. is that true just because they're not paying i guess so because you're just like yeah it's just like dinner at my house and uh, that's not illegal this guy is such a big brain i love it that's the food sorted but what about the fact that there was nothing even resembling an outdoor restaurant outside ubar's shed well that was easy enough to take care of he seemed to have been able to just borrow tables from somewhere nearby and was able to borrow a giant outdoor heater since november at night could easily be uncomfortable <laughs> 
The shed was supposed to have a rustic vibe, and there was a little playhouse in the yard. It was like a kid's treehouse, but on the ground instead of in a tree. Ubar decided that he was going to fill the playhouse with chickens, just like how upscale restaurants have lobster tanks where you can pick out your own lobster. His initial plan was to tell people the playhouse was there so people could pick their own chicken. Of course, the very first guest served was confused by this answer, as TripAdvisor had them listed as a vegan restaurant. So, for the rest of the night, the playpen full of chickens had nothing to do with the menu. They were just there because, well, apparently, f*** you. Ubar did actually own the chickens, so they were accompanied by Trevor, a man he had rented them from. <laughs> you can rent chickens? Okay. <laughs> The number one restaurant in London featured a playhouse full of chickens for no discernible reason, and there was also some dude named Trevor sitting outside the playhouse who did not appear to be being served food. It was just a man sitting in the corner holding a chicken. There was also a ladder against the shed providing access to the roof where there was a table and two fake guests. Now the shed looked like a restaurant and would taste like a restaurant, or at least taste like microwave mac and cheese, and that was dressed up with some herbs to make it look fancy. One of Ubar's friends worked as a professional chef, so at least he could say the food was professionally prepared and the plating was nice. All that was left was the ambience. He hired a DJ to pump in restaurant sounds so people would feel like they were in a real restaurant. The DJ also had a button that he would frequently hit that made a ding sound to disguise the noise of Ubar's microwave going off as their meals were prepared. This wasn't some dime store DJ either. The dude was a professional. The first couple they served were American, so he filled the air with sounds of an American restaurant. They weren't holding anything back to make this the best damn fake restaurant that the world had ever seen. When guests arrived, they would call the burner phone and Ubla would meet them at a nearby intersection. He didn't want people to actually see how to get to his house or rather shed, so they were blindfolded and led to the location. Fake guests were always at the meeting, as well as real guests, and oh, when the fake guests didn't hesitate to putting on the blindfolds, the few real guests who were reluctant about the idea gave in. Oh, crowd psychology, right? Like, everyone's putting on those masks. You're like, yeah, of course I'll put on the mask. Okay, because let everyone else is. It's fine. <laughs> That go it goes way further than that. It's crazy what people would do when other people do it. Another friend of his was working as a waitress, and she was asked to privately get the guests to tell her what they thought away from the cameras. Unsurprisingly, the reviews were positive. Maybe it was all in their heads because of the prestige of the place, or maybe it's because mac and cheese and chocolate pudding, which are already delicious, taste even better when they're free. No, it was the crowd thing. It was the crowd and the reputation and all of this stuff. You're just like, yeah, it's amazing, because everyone says it's amazing. It's microwave food. For Ubar, the pinnacle of the night was when he blindfolded a couple and escorted them back to the street. He assumed that everyone that attended was going to be horribly let down by the experience, so as he guided them, he was apologizing about new menu items and such. Once they removed their blindfolds, the woman asked, Yeah, so about availability, now that we've been once, is it easier? Ubar was understandably confused, and the husband added, Yeah, is it easier for us to book a table now? He rushed back to his shed to tell everyone else that the couple wanted to book again, and everyone shared a hearty laugh. <laughs> 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 but repeat customers were not to be. I mentioned before that two things happened, and the shed hitting number one was only one of them. The other was that TripAdvisor sent Ubar an email simply titled Information Request. The game was up, and he talked to a representative from the website who was not terribly pleased. Oh, come on, TripAdvisor. You got a little egg in your face. It's okay. Lean into it, TripAdvisor. Their official opinion was that while the experiment was interesting, his ability to avoid their normal safeguards and fraud detection didn't really prove anything. Wait, what safeguards? Getting a phone? <laughs> what fraud detection? There was nothing that seemed to stop him, TripAdvisor. TripAdvisor explained that most fake reviewers are for restaurants that actually exist, and their algorithms are only designed to detect these aberrations among reviews from real businesses that will also be receiving real reviews. Oh, that's quite clever. They'll compare them to the real reviews. They'll compare the reviews and see if anything's amiss. Okay, that does kind of make sense, and that is kind of clever, TripAdvisor. Well done. If the entire restaurant is fake and all of the reviews are fake, any of the patterns that would be otherwise existing would not be present. Ubar felt that this was a fair point, and I agree. But it's still hilarious that a restaurant that didn't exist could spend two weeks as London's number one restaurant, and the story isn't even over yet. Media tour. Ubar broke this story himself on Vice in December of 2017, so a month after the shed had reached number one. This is also the night, mean, like, as a journalist, you could just do this as a joke and be like, no, I'm a journalist. Like, I feel, does that get you out of trouble? Like, if you're doing that, and then they're like, oh, it turns out that um, it's actually not allowed to do that. It'd be like, it's journalism. That's not, that's not, that's not how it is. There are laws. Like, if you poison someone <laughs> with your microwave pudding. 
Immediately, he was inundated with interview requests. By his own account, he did 20 hours of interviews in a row. Part of me, that sounds like an exaggeration, but he was getting worldwide attention, so it very well could be true. I don't think it sounds unreasonable. Like, press tours are a thing. Like, um, if he had a PR person, they'd probably line them all up in one massive day of interviews because that's how it's done. And it, yeah, no, I find that totally believable. However, there was something that he realized very quickly. No matter who was interviewing him, they all asked the same questions. Nobody cared about him. They just cared about the shed and the ridiculous hoax that he had perpetrated. Well, of course, because that's what that's what it's about. That's the that's the thing. That's what you're being interviewed about. They're not going to ask you about you know you. I mean, maybe in a small amount to talk about like who you are and why it came to this. But the thing they're interviewing about is the shed. It's not a biography piece. If the story wasn't really about him, did he even need to be there? Oh, that's clever. He's going to replace himself. And since a potential future employer or girlfriend could be watching or hearing these interviews, did he really want to risk fumbling over his words and looking like an idiot in front of the entire world? The obvious solution to that may be to stop doing the interviews entirely or to only do written interviews. It's a lot easier to make yourself sound clever and interesting when you have time to think about your responses, though many in the comments would tell me I could still use practice. But Ubar decided he was going to go a different route. The Ubar that people thought they knew was the carefully crafted online presence he'd created over the years and that he felt was better than the real deal. He wanted the world to meet that person, not the normal, boring version of himself that lived in a shed. <laughs> Dude, you live in a shed, it's kind of interesting. I couldn't believe you lived in a shed. London's real estate market, holy sh**, there are people who work for Vice. That's a real job, living in a shed. If he wanted to appear better in his interviews than he really was, the only logical solution was to hire a fleet of Ubar impersonators who would conduct all of his interviews in his place. The man who created a restaurant as a hoax was about to have all of his interviews about the hoax also be hoaxes. After an extensive day of auditions, he selected someone to play the role of charming Ubar, a better looking and more personal version of himself. This is so clever. Unfortunately, the first attempt didn't work. The BBC didn't see through the ruse. Charming Ubar just hadn't been properly prepped on the story, and they winded up cutting the segment because his answers were very boring and shallow. If this was going to work, Uber needed his doppelgangers to be better prepared. They needed to know everything about both the shed and Ubar's life. The next attempt came in the form of a radio interview. Since the public wouldn't be seeing his face, he enlisted the services of Smart Ubar. Smart Ubar didn't look anything like the authentic version, but by simply bleaching his hair blonde, it was enough to fool the radio hosts. The recording was a success, and Smart Ubar went on a radio tour giving interviews and letting the world to see what a brilliant and philosophical thinker Ubar was. This was all well and good for radio, but he wanted to be more than smart. He wanted to be downright sexy. Enter sexy Ubar, a former Instagram model whose first role was going to be an interview on India's largest English language television channel. Models aren't generally known for their speaking skills, they're just supposed to shut up and look pretty. Sexy Ubar was tripping over his words to the confusion of the TV hosts, and the whole thing definitely could have gone better. Yeah, but it's all kind of part of the fun, isn't it? Like the fact that these are getting, you know, that they are kind of f***ed up is kind of part of the joy of this whole thing. But there was still a lesson to be learned from this experience. If you're sexy enough, nobody gives a shit what you have to say anyway. Following the TV appearance, Ubar was receiving numerous opportunities in India based solely on the bangability of sexy Ubar. With smart Ubar and sexy Ubar both killing it, it was time for charming Ubar to get another go. He was going to appear on a Bulgarian talk show via video chat. Since it was a remote interview, there was a simple contingency plan in place. The real Ubar was just off camera holding a dry erase board so that he could quickly jot down answers to guide Charming Ubar. The Bulgarian interview took place on a sunny day, and Charming Ubar was outside where the fake restaurant had been during the video call. Did it matter that the real Ubar was clearly visible in the reflection of his sunglasses for the entire interview? Of course not, because he was charming. For six weeks, Ubar didn't conduct a single interview himself. He just sat around listening as his army of real-life avatars made him look and sound better than he really did. Does Ubar have, like, some infinite bank account? Because this is a lot of actors that you're hiring. <laughs> But finally, it was time for the ultimate prank. None of these reporters who were interviewing Charming, Smart, or Sexy had ever met the real Ubar before. Could he fool someone who had? He was going to do a repeat appearance on the biggest morning show in Australia, where he would be seen by millions of viewers who had already seen the real him only a few months earlier. To pull this off, he was going to need someone with all the necessary knowledge to properly impersonate him. Enter Slim Ubar, his real-life brother Peter. Despite being the brothers, the two don't really look alike. Even after bleaching Peter's hair, there was a very little family resemblance. Luckily, they had an ace up their sleeve. Ubar sent Peter into the show wearing denim overalls and no shirt. There was absolutely no reason for it, and it was confusing and distracting enough that nobody really realized that they were talking to a completely different person than the last time. 
that's amazing. Peter even got to repeat the two canned lines that Ubar had given him. I've been really interested, especially with this, in identity fluidity, and I'm not even the same person I was a year ago. <laughs> Talk about on the nose, but the comments flew completely over the morning show host's heads. Wrap up. What began as a simple prank to see if a fake restaurant could get listed on TripAdvisor turned into so much more. It became London's number one restaurant despite not existing, and then became a genuine restaurant selling frozen dinners, while the DJ entertained guests, both human and feathered, with the ambient noise of a real restaurant. But for Ubla, it wasn't just a hoax. It wasn't just a funny story he could tell people or a ticket to fame. The saga earned him an invitation to the Drum Online Media Awards in April 2018, where he was nominated for Content Creator of the Year. It's an honor just to be nominated for an award, but I'm sure he couldn't have been more proud as he heard his name announced as the winner while he watched the ceremony from home. Accepting the award on his behalf was awards show, Uber, and the presenters didn't have a clue. And I love that. Thank you so much for watching. So I really hope you enjoyed today's video. Please do check out today's fantastic sponsor, War Thunder, which you can play for free on PC, PS5, and Xbox Series X and S at playwt.link forward slash brainblaze WT bonus. And there is a link to that below. And uh, yeah, you'll get an exclusive bonus. And did I mention that it's free? Yes, free! See you next time. Because people in restaurants think like this, don't they? They're like, oh, this prick's email, if you like his work email or whatever. I've seen you before. You're the asshole on TV. <laughs>